Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's alumni FI section. In this section, alumni from 2008 and 2010 will discuss how they steer their career through the challenges and difficulties of the last recession. Using example from their own careers, alumni will discuss the opportunities that emerge in time uh, of adversity and how to build a resilient practice to ensure longevity and sustainability. So before I introduce today's guest, I would like to invite you to turn on your camera if possible so our guests could see her audience. Um, so today is a pleasure to, in, to have Julia Kohner. She is the founder and director of JK Design, a faculty member at the University of California, Los Angeles, and architecture editor of the Unseasonal Magazine. Her work is a convergence of architecture, product, and fashion design, and specializing in 3D printing. Her work includes 3D printed fashion pieces for Paris Fashion Week and collaborating with Ruth Carter on the costume for Marvel films Black Panther, which won an Oscar for the best costume design. Her work has been exhibited internationally in museums, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and Palais de Beaux-Arts in Brussels. Uh, my name is Phone. I graduated from the MTech program last year. We are going to have a Q&A section after the talk. So you could raise the blue hand in Zoom and ask in person. Or if you cannot do that, you can raise your question in the chat. Then I could read it out for you. So good. Uh, I will pass over to Julia now. Thanks so much for the welcoming introduction. And uh, very nice to meet you all today in this uh, very new and strange time um, we find ourselves in. I'm very, very excited to be talking today to you at the AA. Um, I've been invited to talk previously, but with travel, it wasn't easy. And so um, it was, it is kind of like a really exciting moment for me to share my path since I've graduated from the AA in 2012 with you, it was eight years ago. So um, my work uh, spans between various different disciplines, between architecture, product design, and fashion and costume design. I have a background in architecture and I'm teaching architecture at the university in California, Los Angeles at UCLA, the architecture and urban design department. And um, I actually started teaching here right away um, after my graduation from the MTech program at the AA and uh, had the opportunity to teach here with uh, Greg Lynn at the postgraduate program for four years in the past uh, four years I was teaching in the graduate program. I'm teaching in the graduate program here. So um, I'm going to talk um, today more about like my path of how I got where I am and how, how I kind of uh, achieved to work between two different continents and establish myself with various different clients in, in these two worlds. Um, maybe to go a little bit further back even than 2012, um, I started initially studying at the University of Technology in Vienna, where usually there are like 500 other people starting to study with you in, in the course of architecture in the first year. And so very early, I realized that I really had to specialize myself if I wanted to be successful in this career path. And after three years, I went to Switzerland and saw an exhibition where Greg Lynn's embryological house was exhibited and that kind of physical model really I thought was so enticing to me that I started to look more into his theory and his design process and I decided to switch to the to, to the architecture program where he taught in Vienna at the University of Applied Arts and um, he was teaching there during a time where there was also Zaha Hadid and Wolf Briggs from Co Pimmelblau teaching and it was a very vibrant time. They had the first 3D printer at the school and I was fortunate enough to engage with this machine and kind of was one of the first ones to experiment with it and see how the process between the digital and the physical uh, kind of works. And so I specialized myself in emergent technologies and really took advantage of this resource at the university. 
it was also a time where uh, we had a lot of um, kind of experiment experiments where the 3D printing technology was not yet so known. And so there was a lot of trial and error. And I learned really a lot from this back and forth process. And a lot of my designs and geometries um, were designed with techniques uh, which uh, were different from today, more analog, because for example, software like Grasshopper was just at the beginning and it didn't really exist yet. So we had to kind of find other means and methods with other softwares to kind of achieve parametric aesthetics, which we were really interested in during that time. And um, we had a lot of uh, interesting international guests coming to reviews. And so one of those was Ross Lovegrove, the industrial designer who you might know from London. And uh, he invited me to start working with him during the summertime. And so I started to practice in London during the summer. I also went there sometimes during the winter. And so while I was still a student at the Angewandte, I went, started kind of going back and forth between London and, and Vienna. And um, he gave me the opportunity to look into how to bring the architectural scale into product design. And wh what does it mean to um, add nuances of aesthetics, such as the reflecting light effects in this light, which we designed for Artemide, and how to innovate on uh, production processes. So we looked into injection molding, 3D printing, and developed a series of different light products for Artemide. This one I would like you to keep in mind because I'm gonna come back to that later on. But here we kind of innovated on the process of how to make 16 parts made out of one single injection mold. Not only reduces this the price of the production process immensely, it also was important for us to kind of show how to bring this kind of natural growth aesthetic into the design and that the light is kind of internally reflected in this light column. Um, I then, after I worked with uh, Ross, I had the opportunity to come to Los Angeles for the first time for the Max Schindler Scholarship. It's a scholarship from the Museum of Applied Arts in Vienna, where you can be for six months in a residency in one of Rudolf Schindler's houses here. It's open for international uh, people except for Americans, which I find really interesting. But uh, there were many different individuals here and we kind of researched, uh, my kind of project was researching the biodiversity of California. And while I was doing so, I thought this kind of biomimicry was really fascinating. And it was actually here in LA that I made this choice. I wanted to go back and do another master in emergent technologies and really learn how these mathematical structures are actually built and scripted mathematically. And so I applied while being in LA for the AA. I knew that this was kind of a dream for me to come to, to come to the AA because having studied at the Angewandt in Vienna, the one school we always were looking at at the same time was the AA and the work. And I was really inspired by the programs there, but it was kind of out of my reach because um, I, I knew that I um, kind of had difficulties to afford it. And so I applied for every single bursary I could kind of find. And then the, I got a bursary from the AA and that kind of made it possible for me to come to the AA and study there. And since I had worked for three years already, I kind of had, uh, had uh, some money saved also to kind of afford the rest of, of the tuition fees. And it was really like, I worked really hard to kind of, get there and it was a really great experience. And so that was also the first time I started to work with 3D scanning. And at the AA, I worked with, um, with Kai Salravi and with Marie Boltenstern. And uh, we kind of um, worked through the research of cellular complex systems. And we used CT scanning, um, computer tomography to understand the underlying substructure of corals and really look into the porosity levels of these natural formed uh, systems and developed scripting methods uh, to realize those um, micro scale of geometries and used 3D printing to kind of start to make those elements tangible. And um, after graduating from the AA, 
um, I was uh, interested in kind of developing those microstructures further. And so we looked into robotic plasma cutting to realize a competition entry for a facade prototype at the Acadia conference in 2013. Um, we were the finalists for the TexFab skin competition. And we further developed that uh, cellular complex systems and looked into plug and push systems and um, uh, used CNC technology to realize this installation at the Architecture and Design Museum in Los Angeles, which was part of the organ partly partially organized by the or was organized by the AIA Los Angeles and showcased 32 best student projects. So it was kind of an exhibition design. The beauty of this project was. Um, there was very little money available for like for as as the winners of this competition. Um, and so we had to find our own sponsors because we wanted to make it really great. And so we find found a material sponsor um, who agreed that if we would buy the material from them, they would kind of CNC machine all the parts. They usually CNC machine windows for Boeing. And so um, they didn't necessarily knew what they got themselves into when they realized all the little different parts of the numbers and so on. It took like almost two weeks to fabricate it, but we were really proud. We were able to realize this uh, with a very small budget and it got a lot of attention and it's uh, also a project which we were able to uh, package into a crate, which is only like um, one by one. I said, um, I, I said that uh, this exhibition traveled to Jordan and was exhibited at the Amman Design Week. Uh, it fit into a crate, which is about one by one by one meter. And here on the bottom, you uh, see my partner, Kais, uh, showing the installation to the Queen of Jordan. It was really amazing to kind of um, bring this installation from LA to Jordan. We also exhibited last year at the Aman Design Week, a project which was uh, called Columns to Crowns. And uh, this research was inspired by the Nabataean column capitals, which you find in the desert in Petra. And uh, it's actually a research which is going on since the last four years. We have been, uh, I have been part of the AA visiting school in Jordan. And uh, for about five years, we were doing the workshops there, not the last year and this year, also this year due to the pandemic, but it was one of the largest visiting school programs and it was is, is really exciting to be part of it because it not only allows me to stay in touch with other AA alumni and kind of exchange every summer our experiences in the different parts of the world, but it was also great to kind of um, meet new people who were interested in studying at the AA and kind of, um, go to this otherworldly place, uh, which looks like the Martian landscape and do research there. And so the project which evolved uh, from columns to crowns, which looked into these kind of uh, different aspects of architecture to fashion, right? The, it was also past uh, the project I did for Black Panther where I designed the crown for the main character. So the project kind of is a means of uh, kind of finding the relationship between the two. And so it was a series of 25 columns uh, which had these crown capitals. And we developed this project this year further. Due to the pandemic, we were constrained in the fabrication and we looked into 3D printing this in-house. And so these two large art sculptures are now installed in Santa Monica. They were 3D printed in-house. Um, they're hollow inside, super lightweight, made of a material which can adhere to outside um, conditions for two years, it will be exhibited. And it was kind of a really uh, great experience to be challenged and produce this ourselves. Uh, due to the kind of various different constraints in California and, and shops had to be closed. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the cross-disciplinary design process and how in the during the time of uh, my graduation at the AA, I started to collaborate um, with uh, fashion houses. So while I was actually working on my dissertation, I had the first project with Iris van Herpen, a Dutch uh, fashion designer, and um, I got in contact through her through a 3D printing company in Belgium, Materialize, who I had previously worked with when I was at Ross Lovegrove. And so they knew my work, they knew um, I kind of had specialized in this, in this technique. And so they recommended me to work with her. And um, various different projects came out of this. I then developed uh, those 
techniques further myself and I was really interested in the material properties of this flexible 3D printed material. And so I looked at the micro scale of deep sea sponges and how um, to abstract the growth logic of this sponge and translate it into a scripted garment, which um, essentially looks like it is grown around the body. This is a, a rendering. And I implemented um, biodegradable PLA parts, which are printed with um, uh, photochromatic pigment. So it changes its color from black to white uh, when with the temperature. And so the dress was meant to showcase the mood of the wearer essentially and its experiences. And so I keep on looking back and forth uh, between these biological systems. I find structures like kelp on the oceans and beach here in, in Malibu. And then I kind of uh, developed those uh, pieces for my own collection, looking into the microscopic scale of growth patterns of these algae systems in the kelp, but also kind of a, a biomimicry technique. Uh, so not always it's directly translated. Um, I kind of then take those um, ideas and methods and develop them further with my own met methodologies. And so I, I use 3D printing in multiple technologies. This is a polyjet technique from Stratasys. Um, I developed in 2015 another piece, the kelp jacket. And uh, uh, this was uh, one of the uh, first pieces in the polyjet technique where I looked into the micro scale of portobello mushrooms and the underside and the humenium structure of it. Um, I, I then thought that it would be really great to develop those more into accessories, just also because of the costs associated to 3D printing. And so I developed a series in 2017, the Iceland collection, um, where one of the necklaces I had at the auction exhibited at the AA, I think uh, last year. And um, this, uh, this series was meant to make the 3D print more accessible and also more wearable essentially. And there was also a collection of, of handbags, the Humanium bags, uh, which I developed. And so this kind of uh, special specialization in the 3D printing allowed me to collaborate also with many other artists and designers such as Marina Hermans Eda. We did a smock, uh, smocking technique where we imitated textile smocking an old craftsmanship. Um, I mentioned Iris von Herpen. This was one of the first 3D printed dresses. I actually designed that while I was um, in, in Amtec. Um, and, uh, and it was really great because uh, we went to, to Paris to the Haute Couture shows and it was one of the first 3D printed dresses. It got a lot of recognition. You can see here some renderings of it, the combination of using various different softwares. Um, and it was exhibited at the Achilleb exhibition. Um, so both in architectural context, but also at the Manus Ex Machina exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum and in various different other museums across the United States. The technology I use is um, var various between hard and soft materials, between uh, selective laser sintering and other techniques. There's a video here. And so we, I collaborated with Iris uh, on three pieces in total, the hybrid holism dress, the voltage dress and um, the biopiracy dress. This one was uh, showcased in the National Geographics next to a 3D printed ear and um, next to a NASA suit as one of the kind of revolutionary things in 2014. And so this was also acquired by the Phoenix Museum of Art. And um, last year was for the first time that the curator was actually really interested in showcasing um, the 3D renderings and the processes behind. So uh, imagine like only five years after this dress actually debuted in, in the fashion show, there started to be like an interest into the process of how it was made and showcasing the kind of behind the work. Um, and in 2018, I started to, uh, actually 2017, I uh, started working with Ruth Carter on the movie of the Black Panther. And um, it, this was one of the greatest experiences because I had a call on my uh, phone, uh, on my voicemail when I came back from uh, Europe. 
and uh, it was a costume um, house in, in Los Angeles and they didn't tell me what movie it was for or what character and what uh, production it was so I, I I got really excited. I thought it was a small movie project. And as I kind of went into the production of it and started the design process, um, I slowly started to realize what I got myself into. And kind of when um, when I learned uh, what movie it was for and the pre-sale was sold out, it kind of really grew on me in a, in a way. And uh, it was a fantastic uh, journey. Uh, to be part of it, uh, there was we designed the crown for the Queen Ramonda, and uh, we designed the shoulder mantle um, as well. So Wakanda is this kind of uh, futuristic city, technologically really advanced. And so R Ryan Coogler and uh, Ruth Carter really wanted the regal attire of the Queen to kind of showcase um, this advancements in technology. And so they wanted also the main character to kind of uh, represent it and word, wear it. And so one of the main things was that I was told it had to look like something which cannot be done in any other way. And so that was really a task um, because it was a really short time zone and was a very complex project. I also worked with my partner Kais uh, Alravi on this. And um, we, we kind of, um, whenever there's like larger scale projects, uh, one other one, which I'm unfortunately not able to show for one of the biggest fashion houses in Paris, we also work together in it. And when I went to see the movie, um, I found myself in, in this scene in this technology lab and you see on the right this light. And I told you at the beginning, remember that. So I went to see the movie and all in a sudden saw a dozen of these lights, which I had designed in 2011 with Ross Lovegrove in the scene. Neither him nor me knew uh, about, uh, about this. So they had a, the production designer had acquired that from Artemide and kind of placed it into the scenery. So the kind of aesthetic really, um, was more so in, in the movie, which was really an interesting experience going to the movies and seeing it for the first time. So Ruth Carter was the first black American uh, woman to win uh, the, an Oscar in the category of costume design. So that was a really exciting journey. And she asked me to design a 3D printed stola for her for the Oscar night. And I embellished it with Swarovski crystals. I have a long-term relationship with Swarovski and Austrian company which is focused on um, crystals and jewelry and many other research they have also going on and so we worked on a showpiece which was showcased at the opening of the manufacture in 2018 crystal glaciers which looked into 3d printing with glass and um, in the last two two years i focused more on working and advancing the 3d printing in the fashion design and so for example i developed this um, cite jacket which is multicolor 3d printed for the chromorpho collection of stratasys and um, it's the color is directly printed onto the fabric it's printed on denim it was inspired by the madagascan sunset butterfly moth and I took the microscopic scale of these uh, micro sete, they are called, uh, the hair-like um, structures on the wing of the butterfly, and translated them in an algorithm uh, which, which then was replicating those pixels, and they were directly 3D printed onto denim. And it's, a, it's one of the first pieces printed in this technology, and so um, one of the challenges in this was essentially to kind of really uh, explore the coloration, the multicolor, the effect of what the relationship between the fabric and uh, the material has and, and how that can be translated into the physical. And following up that, I had a nine months research, uh, which was just finished in September, where we looked into continuing the 3D printing on the fabric. And um, my goal is really to innovate on local production, on-demand production, a sustainable process. So I worked with 100% hemp, um, which doesn't, which uses less water in the production. It's not, it does, isn't colored or anything. And I worked with the additive manufacturing process of 3D printing onto the fabric. And so I thought, well, if I 3D print this, I can send the digital uh, files globally wherever they have this 3D printer. 
but then they have to ship back the textiles to me in order to kind of sew them together. That's what we did in the Cite jacket. But then I thought, well, why not just 3D print directly the buttons onto the garment as well? And so uh, then use a laser cutter to cut out the shapes. And uh, that, that's the way how it could go directly to the production. Um, Fasteners is one of the biggest business in the world. And so this was a huge research for the last nine months where we innovated on like producing this garment, which is made out of 33 parts, which can be combined and uh, changed and also don't use any sewing. So there's a, a video here which shows we went for a photo shoot into the desert because of COVID, we couldn't shoot it anywhere in the city. So we had to go somewhere else. It was extremely difficult to find actually a photographer, makeup artist and so on because of all the restrictions in California. And so under the kind of difficulties of the situation, um, I was extremely excited to be able to realize and finalize the project because it was put on hold for two months and kind of, uh, yeah, it was a challenging process uh, to realize that. And um, there, here's, I also started to work with like digital methods of uh, integrating software which analyzed 3D body scans and then uh, developed a digital workflow which essentially could. Um, make the size adaptation automated so that I don't have to remodel every time I kind of work uh, with a 3D printing um, process. One of the last projects I wanna share is this was also 3D printed in-house. So I start looking more into materials and methods which I can produce with my own printer. And this was a tutu uh, for a Bauhaus event. Uh, Bauhaus celebrates 100 years and the Bulltaub showroom, a um, kitchen manufacturer, a German kitchen manufacturer here in uh, Beverly Hills as a showroom. And they wanted to make an event uh, in regards to the Bauhaus and show like a ballet uh, where a dancer choreographer, uh, Ross Warby, who is also professor at UCLA would wear it. But due to the pandemic, we couldn't make the event. And so right now it's uh, purely exhibited at the showroom and we are thinking now about ways of perhaps making a video for it. Um, the final part of the lecture talks more about the collaboration and co-production and how these interdisciplinary work processes, which I developed through these collaborations, transfer back into my acad uh, academic engagement. And so at UCLA, I teach a lot of research uh, with robotic technology and kind of innovating uh, with novel methods. Um, and we look into fabric uh, concrete casting with robotic technology at uh, clay 3D printing with robotic technology. And also at uh, most recently um, in robotic timber assembly um, as an idea of new assembly methods um, with traditional jitter rejoinery, which does not involve any glue or adhesives and is purely a kind of way of assembling um, elements together. And beyond that, I, I also teach in the graduate program. So I, I teach uh, core design studios, advanced building construction courses, introductory design processes, and so on. And um, I, I tend to uh, bring a lot of my knowledge from the AA and MTech into my teaching here at UCLA. And uh, it, it really has taught me a, a unique way of thinking about architecture. And uh, I think that you always have to see the kind of overall whole uh, roadmap. I started studying in 2002 and now it's, uh, you know, 18 years later. So the, what I showed you today is kind of a process over the last uh, 18 years, essentially. Um, specializing in, in a specific niche and kind of I built my own kind of bubble in which I operate. Uh, there aren't many people in, in this area. And so um, it, it is a challenge because often I find myself in projects like the movie project where I do not have no role model to look at and I don't know how it's done because I've never done a movie before and so I find myself in, in a lot of challenges but at the same time this is something which inspires me and this is something which I almost think I need as like a, a kind of push to uh, think about something 
uh, new and kind of uh, rethink the methods and techniques of how they are done and bring our knowledge from architecture into other fields. And um, yeah, I think uh, with that, I conclude uh, the lecture. I, I really wanna thank everyone who kind of has shaped this path. Um, it's really important to connect with, uh, with people um, which are kind of helping you to um, grow in this field also. And so certainly certain people like Ross Lovegrove, Greg Lynn, Mark Foster Gage and uh, Iris Van Herpen and others have kind of shaped my career. And there were also experiences uh, which were, there were great experiences and there were also terrible experiences I made on this, on this road. So um, I think, um, Maybe the last thing I want to share is that I originally was interested in fashion and architecture at the same time. And when I applied for the fashion studio in Angewandte for Raf Simon's uh, class, I, I was not accepted. And so I decided, well, I, I then study architecture. And I didn't know that uh, many, many years later, I would be able to design for the biggest fashion houses in Paris. And I know now that I would have never been able to do that today if I would have gone the traditional way of studying fashion. And so studying architecture really opens so many doors because it's so versatile. You can go in so many directions. You can go into graphic design, into movies, into production, into um, business, into building, into construction. There's so many uh, scales you can work and engage with. And so I just wanted to share that um, roadmap with you. Thank you so much, Julia. It was really inspiring and encouraging because I didn't come from, I wasn't come from an architecture background as well before MPAC. Nice. Uh, so, uh, yeah, um, I just need to remind everyone, if you have any question, please raise your hand in the Zoom. You could click the participant uh, list and then you will see a raise hand option on the bottom right. And then I will unmute you and then you can ask your question. Uh, if you cannot raise your hand, then um, you can send your question to the chat. I could help you to uh, set it out. So um, um, maybe when people are gathering their thoughts, I will start with uh, the first question. Uh, so right now, due to this pen pandem pandemic situation, I believe a lot of graduates are facing the same question of, uh, how to find a job or where to move forward. And because so many uh, companies are not hiring, do you have any advice to people who are facing these problems? What's the best move in this situation right now? And like, how, like, um, should they, should we learn something new or should we, uh, what kind of move that we think is the best move in the current situation? So I think, um... I think I can only talk about my own experience in that sense. And I remember that I did not have very fixed ideas of what, which place I wanted to work or like when I was studying at the AA or at the Angewandte, I did not uh, have, sorry about this construction out there. Okay. I didn't know um, about the kind of uh, places I would direct uh, and go. So I kind of always went with opportunities. So when, and, and obviously that was really hard work coupled with luck that I got opportunities, but I don't think it comes from nothing. You have to work really, really hard and know that every single presentation, wherever you show your work, it must be at its best level because you never know who is coming to look at the work. It could be a really small pinup. It could be a really small, like you could go to a really small lecture uh, and there might be somebody who you meet who really opens many doors for you. And so um, in a lot of cases, I did not know what the next step would be. And when I was graduating, graduating from MTech, I did not know what would be next. And so I actually applied for an uh, assistant professor position in Vienna. Um, that was what I thought would be my next step. And 
Greg at that time was actually looking at, for someone here in LA at the same time. So he was looking for someone in Vienna and in LA. And he asked me, well, you can come to Vienna, but would you want to come maybe to LA? And I was like, wow, this is a huge decision to make. I don't know, it's so far from my family, right? It's it's like a new world. I have kind of built up my world in Europe and I then decided, well, that's a one-time opportunity. Let's just try it. And so I, I went there and uh, I knew it was not uh, the kind of framework um, I would say the academic framework, which is maybe similar to the MTech program, which is probably more ICD or ETH. And that was what a lot of my colleagues were kind of wanting to go to do a PhD there or like wanting to go to work in offices where, where they can directly apply the techniques they learned in MTech. And I knew that that was a little different in a different world, but I said, well, I can build my own world in that sense. And so I said, I, I go, I do it and I never regret it. And uh, however, I was every year on a, on a one-year contract. So that me meant that every year I was waiting for my contract to come in the next year. So that's a huge challenge every year to not know if you will have a job next year again. And that's when I started to make, uh, found my own company and I knew I had to build up my own second foot. So I kind of was operating on two jobs at the same time just in order to be secure that if anything happens, I do have those two paths and that's how it evolved. And you have to be kind of really ready to work day and night in order to make your dreams come true. That's, that's something which is unavoidable. Um, yeah, I think, I think one thing is a, a piece of advice. If you get to meet someone like, who you feel like your ideas align with, stay in touch with that person. Even for there might not be immediately an opportunity to get a job, be open for unexpectedness. Hmm. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, and I, yeah, I, I originally wanted to ask like, when did you have the idea you would like to open your own firm? But then you answered the question. Um, it, was also, it was also because that was in 2015 and I got a really big project with one of the biggest fashion houses. And I was like, I really have to make this serious, right? And it's not easy to open a company in Austria. It's much easier in London because in London, you don't have to put a lot of investment to be a self-employed person. In Austria, it's much more difficult to open a company and it, it's um, related to much more costs. So um, it was, it was a challenge, but I'm happy I did it because it just established myself professionally in, in Austria. And so that's when I started to fly kind of back and forth like crazy. Um, so right now it's not possible, but yeah. Cool. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, did the, is the pandemic affecting, affecting your businesses as all? Yes. Like, as well? So, yes. so for example, yeah. as I told you in some of the projects, the events were canceled or projects were um, put on hold for two months and then continued. Um, it was difficult to realize some of the projects due to the restrictions, uh, you know, what I mentioned with, with the photo shoot, for example, and, and the kind of work process. At the same time, there was a time during the pandemic where the projects were populating like mushrooms because all in a sudden everyone wanted to work digital and looked into the kind of direction that everything can be digital now. And, uh, and I found myself in a way, well, I have worked like this since years. I've worked online with international partners since years. This is nothing new to me, like uh, to do projects in different time zones and wake up at 5 a.m. in order to meet someone in Europe. It's like, it's, it's something I'm used to from before, but at the same time, there was so much coming up that I, I think uh, in a way, one challenge which I was finding is that many, um, there was a lot of opportunities coming up, but a lot of unpaid opportunities and a lot of architecture initiatives like uh, events and conferences and like teaching engagements and stuff 
unpaid. And so I started like to say no to these because it would take time from, from other things I wanted to be, be engaged with. And so I, I think that that's one of the things where we architects have to uh, really be strong in. We have to know what our value is. We have to know what we can ask in terms of, uh, of you know, what we, what we are worth. And, and that's something I learned also from my collaborations in other disciplines. So it, it is really important to, uh, to make sure that you are, when, when you are engaging in things which are not necessarily related to, um, I know, personal interest um, that you ask for being paid. Hmm. Um, so talk, uh, I, I saw in your presentation about biomimicry, it is something we really learned in Nantang, right? Um, I'm just thinking if, uh, if like now maybe we have more free time during this pandemic time and we'd like to learn more about this technology slash uh, art slash architecture kind of topics. Do you have any uh, software or books or channel or platform that we could look into to gain more like knowledge about this profession? I think one uh, one person I really like uh, to look at, uh, Dizin made recently a really cool series, uh, Design for Life. Um, it's, uh, I, I myself gave a short uh, video interview for that, but uh, they, for example, interviewed Michael Pauvelin. He wrote the book Biomimicry. I think he's a really great reference. I like to read his books and his work. Um, I, I'm also inspired by the by the work of um, of uh, obviously Neri Oxman and the MIT Research Lab, um, the Media Lab. Um, I'm I, I like the, her work a lot. Um, I think I think that there is many many resources. I like what Achim Enges is doing at the ICD. Um, I. I think that there is places you can you can look uh, for kind of advancing your academic career by doing a PhD, for example. Um, but if it's more like on an everyday basis, I think that I like to experiment and I like to learn from my students. So whenever it's a new software or so, I usually learn it from my students because they are really into like, uh, you know, they they are motivated to research more into that direction and so I I like to surround myself with students so I usually have like two to three students who I work with in my projects I, I bring them into the office and they get the opportunity to work on projects and we kind of have a, a engaging exchange uh, about processes and so on that's kind of uh, what I look at but I to be honest I don't have so much time or even energy these days to even look at, uh, at, at it because it's it's more what kind of comes at me rather than I'm proactively looking at it. So I'm actually more interested to learn from you guys what you're looking at um, right now. We have one question from Robert. So yeah. he asks, uh, any suggestions for recent graduates on not settling in the workforce or uh, slash maintaining inspiration after school? Oh, that's a, that's a really hard question. It obviously depends on which uh, place you are in your life also, right? If you have, if you do have, um, if you're by yourself and you don't have to look after family, you obviously have much more choices available. You're not bound to a place. Uh, you're not bound to having a uh, that much security in your job but I obviously understand that uh, certain choices you make based on your personal life situation too and so whenever I uh, see graduates from UCLA going to work in co uh, in more commercial firms then it's most likely because of the security they provide and because of the kind of um, also timetable they they provide like working in in hours which are not crazy but uh, 
at the same time, if you do have the leverage to be more free in your choices, then I would go for a more smaller and more experimental office where maybe you do not have the security, but you can grow into it and you can become part of it and you perhaps can grow with the company at the same time. That means also you have to put a lot of more work into it and a lot of more energy and motivation. But um, that would be my advice. You might be more free in the things what you want to bring and you might more work on projects you're interested in and and really want to do and the the third option is to kind of find an academic engagement which allows you to have a security uh, in terms of a job but at the same time can build your own ideas and practices thank you um so we have another question so could you kindly share some tips on applying the architectural knowledge in other disciplines also, what is the process like doing a career change and start working with confidence in uncharted territories? Could you kindly share tips on applying the architectural knowledge in other disciplines? Well, first of all, you have to find people in other disciplines which are open to learn from architects. Um, one way is by finding those people or do really great work and share it on your profile or in, in kind of any way what opportunities you get to make those people see your work. That would be one way. Um, let's say if you, if you have connection to a lab where you can 3D print something or laser cut something or CNC mill something, maybe do a little project, photograph it really great, make, spend the time on putting it up on a website engage with, with platforms which maybe share your work. I remember when I was a student, there was the website Sucker Punch, it's still existing, but uh, I, I happened to know them for, through my work in New York. And so they were publishing my work as a student already. And so that kind of was a, a path for me to get exposure and meet people also. And doing competitions, there are student or graduate competitions uh, where you can get uh, where you can get the opportunity to get your work out there. And so sometimes you can also try to submit your work to platforms like uh, Design or Design Boom and they might feature the work. You can apply with posters for conferences and uh, get your work there. And uh, then take that work, make a great portfolio and go try to find somebody in that other discipline what you, who you would want to work with and make a proposal. Um, and, and take your work and show it to the people. And um, you have to probably try multiple times, not every time works. Um, my list of not realized projects is probably as long or even longer than those which are realized. So I think uh, that's, that's another thing which I think is really important, which we never talk in those lectures about. We always just show the great work what we have done. But I think it would be actually fun to do a lecture where we show all the work which has not been realized or which kind of archived and waiting for, for another time to be realized. Um, hmm. And I think this is the last question. I think people are uh, interested in your office, your workplace, and they ask what kind of in-house 3D printer do you have? Um, I have an I have multiple printers. I have an FDM printer. Um, it's a it's a race 3D printer, um, which prints with biodegradable PLA. And um, I have a resin printer. And um, yeah, so I have like we have I think like four or five printers. Uh, mostly my partner is uh, also looking at those, and uh, we we work together. We use those during the pandemic to 3D print face shields. Uh, so that's another way how we engaged with the architecture community. Um, we were printing, I think, more than 300 in-house and uh, distributed them when there was a shortage in PPE gear. Many architects did that. And so, um, yeah, that made us realize how accessible 3D printers are. You can get now desktop printers for for very little money and you can do a lot with it if you really experiment with it. Cool. Yeah. Tens always do have more questions, which is good. So 
So um, you have mentioned that one of your work did not require any sewing as all parts were 3D printed and assembled together, I think. Um, so how do you see craftsmanship fitting into technology? So I, I've worked with uh, one of the biggest fashion houses in Paris and their oldest embroidery house. Um, and uh, they, at that time, I was really curious because they really wanted to bring the novel technology in combination with the traditional craftsmanship. And that experience taught me how you can uh, learn from this traditional craftsmanship and bring it into computational design techniques, may it be through the technique of weaving and imitating uh, woven patterns uh, with the 3D printing technique to make the material more perform as a fabric uh, rather than as a stiff material. Um, you could also look at uh, one of the projects I shared, like the traditional smocking technique, which is a stitching technique where of pleating. And so um, by looking at those craftsmanship techniques, I kind of started computationally to imitate those methods and uh, drive them like that. I, I, however, thought it was really brilliant when then uh, they started to, you know, do embroidery on top of the 3D print or started to, you know, put sequins and, and, and crystals and, and pearls and so on directly onto the, the fashion pieces. And so the, the kind of two worlds merged, the, the traditional and the computational. And I think that was a really beautiful experience, the kind of merge of the two techniques. And I definitely think that we, when I look, work with my students and look at uh, robotic timber assembly, I look at the old traditional wooden joinery they used in Japan for many, many years. And so there's so much for us to learn from those craftsmanship and to work together with those people and embed them in our process. I definitely think the machines are not replacing the traditional methods of what people are doing, but we are advancing our methods and techniques and can can realize things which we have never been able to do before, but we need to work together uh, with the people who are uh, doing the traditional craftsmanship in that sense also. So like I, during the research project, I worked together with a fashion consultant who was giving me advice in terms of like, what kind of stitches are there? Like, how do you fabrics connect? Um, what, what is the traditional method? And so we worked together in order to realize that. Hmm. So how, um, when you're working for like the design of a costume for the movie, that, that part I'm really interested in, but how is it like, like when you're working with people in really different industry, because you, usually if you're, we're, we're working in architecture companies, like mostly contractor, mostly like construction part of people like engineers and stuff. But I, I think if you were working on a project with movie uh, side, so how is it like working with people that is like not usually uh, collaborating with architects? It's difficult yeah. because they don't, they know very little about our processes. They think that the computer just produces uh, the designs very simple. And so it takes usually a really long time to tell them what pro how our process works and that it's not only that the machine creates it, but actually that there's a designer behind it. I call it digital craftsmanship. And so I, I kind of tell them, look, some of these designs take two months to develop in the computer and then it takes 14 days on the printer. So you, you need to tell me way in advance if you wanna engage in a project and their timelines are different. They want it next week. In fashion design, they want it next month. And then, well, you have two options. Either you don't do the project or you make it happen. When Ruth Carter asked me to make the 3D Stola for her for the Oscars, I had three weeks because between the time she got nominated and asked me to do it and the event, there were three weeks. And then we wanted to do Swarovski embellishment on it with crystals, which I never had done before. So you kind of have to be ready to put, leave everything standing still and really focus on that. And then you have to have the right contacts. You have to have really good relationships with the people who you work with 
you have to nurture those relationships. You have to, with my contacts in the different 3D printing companies, I, I have to have a really good relationship with them if I want them in, in like to realize a project like that in short time. And so that takes a lot of work and, uh, and a lot of engagement and sacrifice too. So it's, it's, it's very hard. And then when you do work with them, they are not used to that the 3D print piece comes out and that's how it is. No, they then want to do alterations. They want to, you know how it is, like they want to change things. That's not possible because you have to do the alterations before you print it. But one thing that was really great was, which they had never done before, was they didn't have the actress casted until very last moment. And so we had to start the design process on creating a 3D file um, and, and then use Grasshopper to change the circumference of the head last minute when they knew what size it would be. And then we sent it to the printer. And in no other technique with mold making, you would have been able to do that because it, the process is so much longer. So that added a new, uh, new way of thinking to the process of costume design. Yeah. I think uh, I have to go in one minute, so. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so th thank you so much uh for today's presentation and um yeah i know you have a meeting to go so i will wrap it up really fast so last thing today i would like to rem uh, thank you so much for julia for the talk it's really inspiring and i would like to remind all of you the next fi section will be on the 10th of november with perpendicular so thank you for joining if you have more questions feel free to email to julia he's at she's at Okay, nice to meet you all and good luck with everything. If uh, you want to get in touch, I put my email in the chat. Uh, thanks to the AA, thanks Anna, thanks uh, Hazel for, for organizing this and uh, I look forward to be in touch in the future. Thank you so much. Bye. Take yeah. care. Bye -bye. That was really good. Thanks. Bye. Bye.